yeah so look this might be uh talking about something that most of you know but just some interesting and background points the top two photos are what you see above the ground so when you see soil being thrown out by the dung pad that's obviously a beetle's got to bury the dung and it's got to make room in the soil for the dung so it chucks the soil out and then if you lift up the pad you see all the holes so that's what we see above the ground but below the ground the left hand picture is a uh, is a is a, a a lump of dung that the beetles they bury the dung in lumps down in the ground and that size of that lump varies a lot with different species and in that lump they lay an egg and so the middle photo is that egg is actually hatched gone through the early uh larva stage and 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 uh, that's a third instar larva there and that that larva will eventually pupate and turn into the beetle uh, which you see is a fully developed beetle on the right hand side and that beetle uh, the the excrement from that beetle makes a little hard shell and so that's called the fecal shell and the beetle will actually uh, you know if you break open what's left of the dung you'll find these little hard shells and that's where you'll find the beetle and so you can actually dig these up and look at them and and work out at what stage they're at and um if the shell is hard the beetle is probably nearly nearly ready to emerge but it's also important to be thinking about these things as we'll talk about as we go in terms of moisture content because um if we get too dry those those shells can actually um get really really hard and i've got a photo not on this talk but a photo of a shell that was so hard it couldn't be cracked with your hand it had to be cracked with a pair of pliers uh so drying out at that stage can actually be a critical for it might prevent the uh, the beetle from emergence and we'll talk about this we're talking about these beetles and your rainfall zones and and your water budget and that sort of thing the other thing about what's happening here is if you look at the middle photo where the larva is there and it's still not at the fecal shell stage it's actually still looks like it's just in a lot of dung um, excess water can actually just just call it there's no oxygen and you get a white fungal growth and the whole thing can rot uh, so a lot of what we're talking about is getting that right that, that right water balance and we'll, we'll look at these pictures we'll talk about that when we talk about the water balance um, just some big picture stuff why I'm really motivated about dung beetles. We've got nine year pasture experiments here and and uh, we're actually done with Bernard Dobe and um, average of average increase of 30% 30% dry matter over over the nine years. That's huge. Um, and if you if we bury the cattle dung um, that falls on Australian soils, we'll put at least 20 million tonnes of carbon in the soil every year. I believe it'd be a lot more than that because there's a lot of other flow on effects. So that's the big picture as to what we're doing. So uh, yeah, that's what dung beetles do. Thanks, Dean. Next one. Um, usually when I've got my mouse, I'm pointing out things on the screen too, so we're missing out on that. Look, this is uh, a good starting point. Seasonal activity of dung beetles for, I put South Urn Australia because what we have in South Australia slightly differs to Southern Australia. There's a couple of species in Northern Victoria, for example, that are not working here in, in South Australia, but certainly the South Australian species is applicable to, to you guys. Now, what we're talking about here, you can see the 
red area on the right identifying the spring gap. Basically, there's next to nothing working in that gap, September, October, November, and, and most of December. You might see the, well, the, the dark blue hatching shows prominent activity period and the light sort of shading shows minor activity period. And in the spring area there, we do have uh, a little bit of um, activity of two native species, Menzechii and Australis, um, but uh, mostly they work sheep dung. The native species are more adapted to uh, the, the dry pellets of roos and wallabies. And so they take better to sheep dung. Um, they, Minzechii will work cow dung a little bit, but what it's basically saying is that apart from a little bit of working of uh, native species, we haven't got anything for that period for, for cattle dung, anything of significance. Some of the summer beetles might start in November in some locations, that's why there's grey there, but there's, there's still a major gap. Now, as we all know, spring is when you get your main pasture growth. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of dung around and we're talking really about uh, a third of the year that we actually haven't got species available um, in Australia. And that's really what led to the introduction of these spring active dung beetles and why we got involved in the breeding of it. Now, I noticed in the site assessment forms that were sent through, um, only two people uh, mentioned that they had uh, winter active dung beetles. So that's another gap that, um, you know, I suggest would be good to look at as a group um, and we could help give you some leads on getting those next year if you haven't got the leads already uh, to fill, to fill um, that gap. A few people said they've got summer active species, weren't too sure what they, what they are. Um, I'd have to say one of the most important things uh, to do before you get any beetles on, on a property is to identify what you do have. And um, if you don't actually um, already have it, I've got a little uh, little tech note on IDing beetles and how to go about collecting them and identifying them that we could send that across. And I'd be encouraging everyone to be to be looking at that, identifying their beetles. And obviously, if you got them, you don't need to get them, um, uh, but that'll help you certainly work out the gaps. So yes, that's sort of the, the big picture. Now, if we go to the next slide, thanks, Dean. Um, just go right down the bottom at the moment. There's under the little heading on the left in blue, new species. We've got three new species, uh, Vaca, Bubalis and Hispanis. Bubaca and Bubalis were brought in in the 90s and they failed to be established in Australia. Uh, they were brought in again in 2012, 2014. Um, um, there was not many of them surviving. And I was given, I was asked by CSIRO and MLA to see if I could breed breed some up, um, and and uh, we've actually been successful, and we've bred them up in the tens of thousands. Next year, we're looking at the hundreds of thousands. So Vaca and Bubalis, uh, basically, um, yeah, uh, as I said, we've bred them up, and now we're looking at at projects like this to get them out. Um, the Copris hispanus, the very bottom row, that was actually introduced into Australia and successful. 20 or 30 years ago, but it hasn't been distributed, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and it's definitely got a lot of potential in that late winter, spring, um, but we, we, I'll explain in a minute why we can't actually, uh, we've got some issues with breeding of that one that we can't actually uh, supply that one at this stage. So that's the, really to indicate why we're looking at these species, Vaca and Bubalis. Uh, they're the two names to remember for the rest of this talk. Um, in between the, um, the first slide and the second slide, there's a bit in the middle that says existing species. There's spinager, agul, agulus, and kaffir. There's other species that are in Australia um, that that could be actually collected and redistributed to some of the properties to fill uh, some of those gaps. Now, um, uh, I was talking to people up near Shepparton area, and some of them have got a agulus there, um, and and some people have got kaffir. So that's another thing to be thinking about. There's really two aspects of, of, of introducing the species. One is these new species, which are not really distributed in Australia. And the other is species that are already in Australia that, um, that uh, we can collect from other sites and take to your site. So that's just putting in context where we know, need to go uh, for species. And as I said, um, Agulis, um, Alexis and Precarious, are three other species that are also in Victoria. 
but we're mainly focusing on the on the spring species. So thanks, Dean. Next slide. Greg, um, just I have a question, but yep. simply because I've got the microphone. But um, are you happy <laughs> yep. to questions on the way sure, through? Yeah. Or? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. So, say from our own perspective, we've got land, we've got cattle. Um, there's some dung beetles there, but there's lots of gaps. And you know, would your strategy or your recommendation be that you try and get as many of different species on the land as possible, or would you suggest starting with vaca or bubalis and you know seeing how that goes? I mean, how, how do you approach that? Because I think everyone's probably in a similar situation yeah. to us. Yeah, and I know Joe and Jess have put a question there too, which we'll address in a minute. Um, look, I I believe that that you should start with one, um, it, like one for spring, one for winter, uh, one for summer, um, because because you never know that might do a good enough job. And Bubis bison is the is a classic example. Um, I know dozens and dozens of farms that Bubis bison is catering for all the winter dung, and there's really not much point in having anything else. Now, when you come to vaca and bubalis, um, we're going to talk a lot in this presentation about, about the suitability of those species, which, which sites they're suitable for. And based upon uh, you know, the best available knowledge, we're going to say, look, I really think this is a site for bubalis, and I really think this is a site for, for vaca. And we're, we're aiming, based upon that knowledge, to basically get one beetle to do that season. Now, it, it may not, it may not, um, and there's going to be issues that, for example, Ubalis is suited for a bit drier areas um, than Vaca, and, you know, there may need to be some areas of the farm that you will actually have Ubalis taking over, but I really think the way to go is to get one species, see how far that goes on your farm before you worry about another species. Does that answer your question, Dean? Yeah, no, that's great. That's good. It yeah, keeps okay. it simple and focused. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mind you, on, on a farm, you know, over the over the over the whole season, you might actually have four or five species overall, although they're cutting in at different times. Um, and what you will find, especially this has happened with the summer beetles, you notice the there's three summer beetles there that are all dark blue in January, February. They've they spread spread very prolifically. And even though you might put one on your property, you might get another one from your neighbour. Um, and so you could end up with two or three in summer. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, three or four, you're going to need at least three or four to cover all seasons. That sort of leads into the question here, can new species threaten or compete with existing species? Um, oh, could we go back? Oh, sorry, that's all right. Just, just go back right there. I'm just answering this question by, it's Joe and Jess Conlon. On the uh, meeting chat, uh, yeah. So, can a new species threaten or compete with existing species if their activity periods overlap? Uh, yes, yes is the question. Oh, is the answer? Sorry, <laughs> um, competing with native species is not an issue because they're not doing a good enough job. Um, but the a classic example for to answer that question is that um, vaca there you can see is active through to December, its main activity period. And then if you look on the very left there, uh, for vaca, it has some light shaded cells. It is, it does have a emergent stage in January and February. And that's that's actually at the time when the summer species are in high, high levels of activity. And that emergence of vaca at that time, it vaca is not going to hurt the other species, more the other species are going to be a problem to vaca because Taurus and Binotus, they, 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 you can get a thousand in a pad. They're just prolific beetles. Vaca that comes out at that time um, needs to, to need to get their newly emerged adults, and they need to get um, feed for a week or two, and then they go into the soil and hibernate until they come out again. And so that actual timing of that overlap is actually a potentially critical uh, competition period. Um, we basically, um, it's yet to be proven, but looking at how dung beetles are in the field, um, you know, we're inclined to think that there will be enough for, because it's not a major feeding period for vaca, um, they just need to fly to a pad and get a bit of food and they stay in the soil and get another feed 
later in the day and stay in the soil. We're inclined to think it will go well, but it is actually um, an issue that that um, does have a small question mark in terms of um, of of vaca's long term survival. It's an issue that probably wasn't thought about when the species was brought into Australia. It's like, yeah, we want a spring active species, but how it's going to compete with what is here could actually be an issue. Um, I hope that's answered that question. I'll just read the next question. Will beetles bury old cow pats from early in the season once they become active? Uh, the answer to that is, is no. Um, they like fresh dung. Um, basically, <laughs> the adult beetles, it sounds gross, but they get their front legs and they squeeze the dung and suck the juices out of it. So it's not juicy, it's not good. Um, now, the next slide here, thanks, spring active dung beetle species. So that's some pictures of the three species that I've mentioned for spring active, Bubalis, Vaca and Hispanis. Uh, this is to deal with Hispanis first. You can see there that little red dot in Western Australia, that's Williams in Western Australia. That's the only place it's been uh, known to have established 20 or 30 years ago. It's a classic example of the problem that we have of a beetle that's been established that we haven't, no one's had the arms or legs or, or willpower or time to actually take that beetle and redistribute it. It's been in Australia for 20 or 30 years and those, those sort of bluey purpley colours on the map show where it's got potential. It's nowhere in the eastern states. Well, it is now because we've got them and we've got them on a couple of farms. Um, but it really is a, a very important issue in terms of how we've done things in the past. We've put beetles out, they've established on a farm, and then we're waiting for someone to come along and harvest from that farm when they, when it, when they build up numbers on that farm, harvest from that farm and establish them somewhere else. We've got two, basically two people in Australia that are doing that, Bernard Dobe and Johnny Fien. Um, they're both um, in their late 70s to early 80s. They've been doing it for decades. Uh, they're not going to be doing it for much longer. I know them and I know their health issues and their, their life demands. And so we actually have got a, a, a real lack of people coming through the system to actually do this, to take beetles that have already been established and put them on other farms. Um, but, but what we're looking at with Vacca and Bubalis is a very different system. And this will make sense as I go through the talk. We're not looking at putting out beetles and waiting for someone to distribute them. We're looking at a system that is going to be self-perpetuating. This is why we want to do the nursery system. This will make sense when I talk, go through the talk. We're actually looking at a system here that is not supplying beetles. It's supplying a system that can be self-perpetuating and you don't need the Bernard Dobes and the Johnny Fians to actually collect them and redistribute. So that's a really important point. So with the um, Bubalis there, you can see the potential distribution in Australia. Red is good, going to orange, yellow, and green is the poorest. And so you can see it's it's sort of red, red, yellow, I guess in, you know, if you get, it's a pretty zoomed out map, but you can imagine where you guys are, northwest of Melbourne, um, you know, you're in a pretty good area for, for, for Bubalis. Um, but if you go down to the VACA map, you can see that in where you are, the red is actually, uh, red and orange is actually stronger and thicker. So they're saying that it is better. But you notice also that the distribution of vaca goes up into northern New South Wales and southern Queensland, which Bubalis doesn't do. That's telling us something. Um, vaca actually uh, likes a little bit of summer rain. Um, and, and this is one thing we're going to discuss when we go into the, your specific sites, the, the forms that you've sent me in. Uh, sent in to me, um, you know, that, that period in, uh, in January, February, where that new emergence is coming out, it, it, it must have a little bit of moisture in the soil. And I do speak from experience because at Strathalbyn, we're about 430 millimetres a year. Our summer rain, you know, on average, it's 20 mils in January, 20 mils in February, and that's an average. So if we're lucky, we'll get some. And I have killed thousands of beetles uh, wrongly <laughs> in here at Strathalbyn, letting, letting them under natural rainfall. I've killed them by not having that little bit of moisture in January, February, and uh, the fecal shells got too hard and the beetles couldn't come out. So that map is actually telling you something about that, that it just likes that little bit of summer rain or that January, February rain in particular. And it likes it likes overall a little bit more higher rainfall than, than Bubalis. The other thing about these maps is that these are maps put out by CSIRO 
and they're very good. They give us a, a, a general idea of the distribution of the species, but they're too broad. I basically followed these maps, so just for background too, I started the dung beetle work in 2002, so that's 18 years ago, and started to put him out on the Fluoro Peninsula and started actually breeding in, in back then too, because I saw the potential for breeding. We needed to get big numbers. I had a lull for four or five years because I, I had to do other things, but I started breeding seriously again in 2014. But when we put these beetles out on farms in 2002, 2003, um, we follow these CSRO guidelines. Now, we're Fluoro Peninsula in South Australia, which I can't point out because I haven't got the <laughs> the, uh, the mouse. But, um, oh, is that showing? No, I'm doing, is that showing you guys? No, it's not. Okay. Okay. Um, we found that, that just putting them on Fluoro Peninsula is not enough, that beetles actually are a lot more site-specific than just regional. And in any one region, particularly where we are in the Fluoro, we've got, stony rocky hills with short stun, stunted cup gums going down to to flooded flooded uh, gullies with uh, with swamp gum everything in between you know pink gum is a bit a bit dry we got blue gum country you know with good loamy soils and nice tall trees we got red gum country which i noticed you've got a lot of red gum country over there and and so we actually uh, found that that the the beetles were sorting out where they wanted to go on the farm. We, we put, put them on beetles on a farm. We put them on a nice loamy flat. We go back a couple of years later. They're not on the flat. They've moved to a dry area. That was Bubis bison. We put Geotruby spinninger out. That didn't mind the wet flats. And so these are sort of things we've got to think about. And this is why when I talk about dung beetles, I talk about trees because the trees tell you a lot about the site. Uh, my actual background is in trees and revegetation. Been doing that for 40 years and you know, lots and lots of work in the government and 20 years in private. So I think of I think of sites in terms of the trees as indicator species, and 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 when I, when I'm looking at beetle recommendations, I say what soil, what rainfall, what aspect, what tree, those sort of things, and that tells me a lot about them. And so when we you're looking at the sites that you guys are going to do, and you've got down there. Um, um, uh, yellow box and grey box and and red gum. Um, that's actually helping me interpret my research data to apply to your sites. And what I'd encourage you guys to do is to think about that as well. Like, oh, you know, Bubala is going to work really good on a yellow box site. Now that's my prediction. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll be able to have more information for um, uh, to give to take that to spread the beetles further in in your region. So. The point of this map, lots of points, but one of them is those CSRO guidelines are good, but we need to take it better to more specific site uh, suitability criteria because otherwise you're going to do what I was doing years ago, wasting money putting beetles on sites where they're going to die. Thanks, Dean. Next slide. So, Greg, um, you just mentioned bubalis and yellow box. What yeah. is it about the yellow box versus a grey box or a red gum that is attractive to the bubalis? Um, I, we don't uh, we don't have Meliodora over here. We don't have yellow box, but I'm looking at it at the, the the size of the tree that it grows to, and the and the sort of rainfall, and uh, and I'd say probably reasonably uh, reasonably heavy soils, not sandy soils. Am I right there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're the sort of conditions that I think that sort of, those sort of rainfall zones. Um, um, the rainfall, yeah, basically, basically rainfall and soil and tree height is similar to what we. I'm actually comparing yellow box to our 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 South Australian blue gum, uh, Lacoxlin. It's a very similar tree, and I'm saying, well, if you can grow a yellow, you know, if it grows as good as a Lacoxlin, then I'm sort of matching it with our Lacoxlin country. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. I got. Greg Denny says no. What's that mean? You can't hear? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what to do there. So this slide here with life cycles. Now, as with any um, any crop pasture animal, we have to understand something about the life cycles to understand how to manage it. It's been really disappointing to me when I've talked about this in the past and I've said to farmers that when, you've got your, when you received your beetles, did they tell you whether the beetles were, what stage of the life cycle they were at? 
were they breeding? Uh, were they in diet? You know, about to go on diet pause or whatever. It's very, very important. I mean, if you if you've got uh, beetles, uh, you know, for example, if I was supplying you um, bubalis uh, at the end of December, you can see on that that there that the dark blue is its main activity period. And so if I I said, oh yeah, I got bubalis, I'm going to supply them at the end of December, and you knew that, you'd say, hang on. <laughs> Why are you doing this? They're only going to breed for a week or two, then they're going to go into diapause. Um, and that's why we're, we're supplying beetles in September. Um, um, so you're going to get the major breeding period. So there's a lot of important points to hand, to think about with life cycle, and one of them in particular is your drenches. Um, for those that do use drenches, um, to time your drenching so that it's um, – it, it's <laughs> It's going to be either outside the life cycle or not have a major impact upon the life cycle. For example, when you read the labels of, of, of drenches, a lot of them say um, will not proven to not have any long term impact on dung beetle populations. Now, that's very, very carefully worded. It doesn't say that they won't kill them. It says they won't have a long term impact. In other words, if you use it at the right time, yes, you are going to kill some beetles, but you're not going to actually knock out all the population. For example, there, if you say you were drenching in December, I don't think anyone was, but if you were, um, yeah, you're going to knock out the last couple of weeks of breeding of bubalis, and it might breed for September, and October, November, but it might not breed for those last couple of months. So overall, yes, you're not going to knock out the long-term uh, population, but you are going to do some damage. And obviously those that are biodynamic and um, organic are not going to have that problem. And um, and those that use moxidectin, which is reported to be the safest drench for dung, 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 beetle, dung beetle friendly drench. Um, but once we go into other drenches, we've got, got those issues. So that's one of the reasons for looking at the life cycle. Um, it's very important to look at the life cycle too, because you guys are going to be breeding these beetles and you, and you need to know what to be looking for, when I've got to be feeding them, when I don't have to worry about them, uh, things like that. And another really thing, important thing to point out about this, this life cycle is that what you see here is not necessarily going to be what you're going to see at your property. In fact, I can almost guarantee it won't be. What I mean by that, the here, this is based upon Strathalbyn. So they emerge, it started emerging uh, in, in August. Last year, they emerged on the 6th of August. This year it was about the about the 16th. It was a bit later, um, but then they had a really really cold snap in early August, and and while they emerged, it was only two or three beetles in every nursery, and it's only in the last week, which is now September, that they've hit their straps and they're and they're starting to come out, and and so what I'm saying is that that's what happened at Strathalbyn, and I'll show you data a bit later on that very very clearly indicates that cooler areas than Strathalbyn, the whole cycle will be delayed and you, they may not come out till late September. So it's a matter of this is the starting point. Uh, we know when it's cooler, it's going to be later. We know when it's warmer, it could be earlier. Um, and it's a matter of looking at what's happening on your property uh, to understand the life cycle on your property. So going through that life cycle, then, as we said, they emerge sometime in, in spring, in, uh, in August, September. They breed. Then they go into diapause, which is like a hibernation stage in the soil, and the and bubalis will stay in that diapause till it comes out to the following spring. So that's its basic life cycle. Now the vaca life cycle that's that's there on the screen now, that also starts at a very similar time to to bubalis in terms of emergence and starting to breed, but it has a little different quirk. The young adults in VACA, which is called the F1 generation, that's entomological terms, the next generation that we call them young adults, they, the, the F1s, they actually emerge in January, February, and um, they actually emerge in January and, and February and feed for a couple of weeks, and then they go into diapause. And so that's why we had that potential issue for them with having competition with other summer beetles at that time of the year. And so we just need some specific management there for uh, the F1s at that time of year, then they go into that diapause and then they emerge and come out again the following spring. So that's the life cycles. Thanks, Dean. Next one. Now, I want to give some history. Um, and the reason for giving the history is it, it helps us to see where we've come from and where we're going. 
Now, the history is, as I mentioned, that there's been a lot of dung beetle species brought into Australia, 53. This is all published work. And only 23 species have been established in the field. Now, that's a monumental failure. That's a, that's a disaster for Australia. Um, 30 species, more than half, never actually were established. And then you've got species like Hispanus that have established and never been distributed. So we have really have not done the best we could do for Australia. The question is why? What happened to 30 species? Well, 10 of those, 10 of those species didn't even get out of quarantine. They weren't even successfully bred in quarantine. Uh, but, but, but the other 20 of those species were actually released. And, and included in that was Vacca and Bubalis, about six or eight years before the last batch. They were both species were brought into Australia and both were a, a complete failure. In fact, the beetles that we have at Strathalban, they were from the second introduction of Vacca and Bubalis, and that was essentially not successful, that introduction. In 2014, we received 67 beetles of Anthophagus vacca. We received a handful of brood balls of, of Bubis bubalis. That was the only remnants of those species in Australia. They had been put out on small numbers on farms, but they had no reports of their success. So we had 67 beetles and a handful of brood balls. That was the remnants of the second introduction of those two species. And they were given to me and, and, and asked, what can you do with them? Well, by the grace of God, we've turned those beetles into literally tens of thousands of beetles. And we're gearing up this year um, to produce over 100,000 beetles next year because we'd had experience in breeding. So this has been the history of, a fa of failure in Australia, and it really is going to highlight the need for what we're doing now is not just getting some beetles from quarantine and putting them out in the paddock and hope they get established, the need for the nurseries and what we can establish with the nurseries. So thanks, the next next slide, please. Um, so this is showing us my belief why we were not successful. We, we brought in, we released small numbers of beetles in large paddocks. Now you look through the history of the releases, sometimes it was 200 beetles, 300 beetles, sometimes it was 600, 700, 800. Yes, now that beetles are established in Australia, when you buy beetles, you'll buy somewhere between 700 to 1,000. But in those days, they didn't have 1,000 beetles coming out of quarantine. They were releasing small numbers. So they're releasing 300 beetles in a 20-hectare paddock, and they walk around the paddock and find a, a dung pad and put it on that dung pad, and then and then all the, beet the 300 beetles or 200 beetles you've got are spread over a big area. Um, it's a big ask. Just they're not even together for mating, uh, the, the, the density per square metre is so low, and I believe this has been one of the main reasons why it's failed. We just they put small numbers of beetles in large paddocks. The other thing we've done is we've done poor habitat matching. Uh, as good as it is, the CSIRO map is only a broad guideline, and I found out for myself the hard way in putting beetles in the wrong place and, letting, and seeing them die. We need much more specific information on, on habitat matching. And I know for a fact that a lot of beetles were put out without actually giving uh, people uh, management information. Um, our State Minister for Primary Industries, David Basham, CSRO came to his place several years ago in December, driving through the Adelaide Hills. He's a dairyman. He's got pretty good uh, green grass in, in, uh, in, dairy in, um, in December, January. They were driving through the Adelaide Hills, uh, wanted to find somewhere where there was green grass, because most of South Australia is dry at that time of year. Walked under his property, said, oh, we've got some beetles, can we release them? He said, yeah. So they released them in the paddock and walked away. He didn't, he didn't find out or didn't remember the name. They told him nothing about what they were, what, how to manage them. And, and, you know, to this day, he doesn't know how they went. So that's, that's not a good way to do it. And it's not giving the farmers information, nothing about what we've already done, like this is the life cycle of the beetle. So they're the problems. So thanks, Dean. So if we're looking at they're the problems, how do we solve the problems? If we put small numbers in large paddocks, obviously the reverse of that is put large numbers in small paddocks. And looking at large numbers is why I, I started on this work on dung, dung beetle breeding. We're going to make this work in Australia. We've got to be able to produce large numbers of beetles, especially of newly introduced, introduced species. Introduced species. Um, we can release them in small paddocks. It doesn't make any sense putting them in a large paddock. Fence off half a hectare with a hot wire or something put a concentration of dung in that area and put the beetles there, that's going to be a whole lot better than putting them out in big open paddocks. I was talking to someone yesterday. Um, yeah, I think it was yesterday. Uh, and they were saying that they they put uh, just collected a whole lot of dung, 
and put in an area two two meters by three meters, all these dung pats in one area, and put the beetles out there. What a great idea. But we can actually do even better than that. We can actually go from small paddocks to farm nurseries and get better breeding. And that's what we're on about. The site suitability information, I've already talked about that. We're looking at not just the broad guidelines, but the, but the, the soils, the rainfall, tree species, all that. And we can provide management information. So that's where, where we're going because of where we've come from. Thanks, Dean. So this is just giving a some pictures of of those points and was 300 to maybe a thousand beetles in a large paddock and it's it's significant to know very important to notice that that method took seven to ten years before there was where they were successful for those beetles to breed up in sufficient numbers to go and harvest from there to spread elsewhere so it's a long long time to do it as well as the fact that you need the Bernard Dobes and the Johnny Fiennes or other people to do it and so it's just, in terms of distribute, distributing beetles and spreading beetles, it's a very, very slow method. Slow breeding, slow till you actually have got the numbers to, 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 to redistribute and lack of people doing it. So obviously, the smaller the, the, the area that the beetles go in or the higher the beetle per square meter, the better it is for breeding. And that's why we're looking at going down to smaller paddocks and now in the end, um, uh, nurseries. Thanks, Dean. Um, this is this slide is to illustrate some some work that we've been doing on working out site suitability. Now, this is one of the nurseries. Um, we're sending in the kits. There'll be two actual nurseries. This is this is the um, uh, nursery that's that's basically a a uh, zinc corrugated iron um, veggie garden bed uh, chosen specifically for its dimensions and. And um, with a method of sealing the beetles from escaping uh, with a shade cloth lid that's sealed around the edges and, and with a zip that you can open, as you can see there. Um, so we call this an SZ, a small, a small zinc loom nursery. Um, now, what we what we did is that um, we've been breeding them here in our Strathalbyn property for many years, as I said. And I started to think to myself, well, well hang on, what we can use these nurseries, put them out on farms. As a, as a method of as a method of testing the how the suitability of sites for these species. So we actually put these farms uh, these these nurseries out on 34 farms. They were beef and dairy farms, uh, as indicated those spots on the map there on the Fluro Peninsula, going from our high rainfall to our low rainfall over a variety of soils. And one of the main reasons we did this was, as I said, to to look at how those uh, species were performing on those different sites. Now, before I go and talk about that, I'm just going to look, I've got some questions here. How far can cattle dung beetles travel if neighboring farms do not have cattle? Good question. Um, um, <laughs> how far would you travel if you didn't have food? It's probably a good way to answer it. Um, they'll fly the shortest distance they can. We've known them to fly a kilometer. Um, I suspect they'll probably fly even more. Um, so they, they'll fly until they can find food. I mean, the other thing is that, <clears throat> that uh, we've done this as well. How long can a dung beetle survive without food? Well, I've done them. Um, I had to do this because I'm sending beetles in the state and I had to know how long they'd survive. And I have basically would say that you can have three days without food, a dung beetle can have three days without food before you start to get any death. Um, and so, and I heard someone has told me recently that they had some were held in the Australia Post for 10 days and they had, I think it was 60% uh, death or was it 40%, one or the other. So, you know, they will last a fair while, but when they're flying, they'll use a lot more energy. But what I'm saying there, I think they'll fly till they find food and I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was several kilometres. They may even travel across the whole farm if cattle are moved too far, moved to a faraway paddock, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but we want to, um, we want to. You'll see, we're talking about one of the things we've talked about in the site assessment is having the nursery close to where you've got several rotation paddocks, because when you actually open the nursery and let the beetles out, you want them to go to a close paddock 
and then move the stock into the next rotation paddock and then follow your rotation paddocks around so that you put all this investment in, you want them to build up and spread out from, from your nursery. That's the idea of it. Uh, so yeah, so we did this site suitability test and the next slide, Dean is showing us some results of this. Okay, so this is for VACA and just go to straight to the numbers on the on the side there. Uh, you can see it goes from 15.3 down to 0.7. This is the, the we call it the, the increase or the X-fold increase. In other words, the, some beetles increased 15.3 times the number of beetles we put in. So we put 100 VACA in each of these nurseries. So the 15.3 fold yielded 1,530 VACA. It's a very good result. In our breeding facility here at Strathalbyn, we've got, we get up to 19. So to get 15.3 on our on our first uh, field assessment, we thought was pretty good. So that's a double tick. That's a fantastic site. Let's go down to 0 0.7 or 0 0.1.4. No way. That's just not going to be a VACA site. You're wasting time and money. Um, and that was particularly for us, um, the very deep gutless sands in our, in even in our high rainfall, the VACA just didn't like them at all. And we think that VACA, um, some beetles, some beetles, when they dig in the soil, they line the tunnels with soil uh, so that the tunnels, the tunnels don't collapse. Um, um, Kaffir is one that does that. And Kaffir works very well in sand because it lines the tunnels, but VACA doesn't. And so it's digging this cavity down in the soil and, and I feel it's probably just collapsing because the sand's not just holding its shape. It's not a beetle that lines its, um, its tunnels or its cavities. And so it just wasn't able to do breeding. That's some of my thinking on VACA. I could be wrong, whatever. I'm just staying away from the deep gutless sands um, uh, with VACA. Um, another thing down there with one of those sites in the very bad area, it was over irrigated. And that was, uh, we actually had photos. We dug up the, um, the brood balls, which is why I was showing them at the start. We dug up the brood balls. We dug up the uh, looking for fecal shells, and we just got uh, a, a soggy mess covered in white fungus. Um, so you're not none of these sites we're looking at in your area are irrigating. I don't think by memory. I don't think that's going to be a problem, but it's certainly something we need to look at in, in irrigated. In irrigated, can we just go back there, please? Sorry, Dean, I haven't finished on that one. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, you, am I going too slow, Dean? Did you want to fast track this a bit? Is that what you? No, can't hear you. Can you still hear me, Dean? Yeah, no, that was nice, no, perfect, Greg. I was just trying to preempt it between moving. Okay, the... all right, okay, hey. okay, okay, okay. So we're talking about sites we don't want to do sand, the sandy and the and the high and the irrigation for Vaca. Get up to four point nine. Yeah, look. I probably wouldn't bother with VACA. I don't think it's that good. I think if we're only getting that sort of yield, we should be looking at, at maybe another species is better. Um, I personally think if you're getting about 7 to, to 7.9, 8 fold increase, yeah, anywhere between there and 15 fold, I think, you you know, long term, you're going to actually build up a good, a good dung beetle population. So, um, yeah, that's the sort of range. Um, and, and you're going to find... One of the really exciting things about doing these nurseries on different properties, you're going to get this range of results. I'm obviously not going to give any recommendation where, where it's going to be a 4.9 or a 1.4. Um, I'm giving you based upon the best available information we have that, you know, it'll at least be sort of 10 to 15. Um, you know, there could be seasonal variations and things that I don't know or, or that, but um, that's what I'm expecting you guys to get a range of results. And, and then with those results, you're able to work out where to put those beetles in the, in, in the future. Again, it's not just supplying a beetle, it's supplying a system so, so you can get the knowledge as well to redistribute those beetles to, to other sites. This, um, this slide also uh, um, illustrates a couple of other points. Uh, this uh, harvest here started on the 8th of January and ended on, I can't read, it's covered by some of the um, team viewer icons, but somewhere just in early March. Most of it was January um, uh, and February, this emergence. And you can see on the very left, some of those some of those sites, they got their numbers very, very quickly, and then they tapered off. So 
uh, you know, some of them really had all their emergence over two or three weeks. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to get that F1 generation emerging over two or three weeks, and each beetle will feed for about two weeks. So your, your whole F1 emergence feeding, um, you know, it might start and then finish over a four or five week period. So that's something else we get out of this, this graph. Um, while we're on F1 feeding, um, it's also really uh, important to notice that when the F1 generation is feeding, you'll see something very, very different with what's happening with the dung. And we've already shown you a photo of the uh, soil casts uh, beside the dung. When there's soil casts beside the dung, that means the beetles are breeding because they're putting big lumps of dung down in the soil in which to lay their eggs. But the F1 generation are not in breeding mode. They're in a mode which they want to just fatten up their body. They're not interested in digging tunnels and breeding it, so they won't do soil cast. What they'll do, they will just go into the soil, uh, you know, five, five to seven centimetres, and they'll dig a little tunnel five to seven centimetres, then they'll come up into the pad and feed, then go into the, that, back down to their seven centimetres, then go up into the pad and feed and back down to the seven centimetres. So there's no soil cast. What, what actually happens is the, the, the dung pad, it looks like it's shredded. They, you know that dung, of course, is made up of fibre, then there's all the moisture content. So if they're sucking all the moisture out of the dung, they're just leaving leaving the fibre content. And so it's just like all the little grass fibres are left and it's sort of like a shredded mass of grass fibres. When you see that, then you know that they're in the F1 feeding stage and not in the breeding stage. And so you'll definitely, you'll definitely be putting dung in your nurseries and then you'll be, you'll be saying, uh, like we say, oh, end of December, oh, I don't have to put much in, they're not using much. And then you'll start us to notice a little bit of shredding around the edges of the dung. And then uh, over after a week or two, you'll just start to notice the shredding will really, really increase and all these little dry fibres will be left. And you just keep putting in dung until the shredding stops. So in other words, that you put in some dung one day and you come back up those days and say, no, oh, there's no more shredding. Then you know that the F1 feeding stage is finished. The beetles are gone in the soil. Uh, they actually go deeper than seven centimetres. Then they go down quite deep, 10 to 20 centimetres. Um, and they're going to, they're now full of body fats. They're going to stay there till the following spring. And if you want to drench, then you can. Uh, so interesting things there that this, this graph is telling you about the timing of feeding and what to look for in terms of that feeding. One more thing, that orange ellipse around one of those graphs there uh, shows you the major impact of a cooler area. This is still on the Fluoro Peninsula. This spot was really, really cool and it basically started its emergence uh, three or four weeks after everyone else. So a lot of information there. Thanks, Dean, next one. So let's start uh, put this into practice as to what it's gonna mean for your farm and your nursery. Now, with your nursery kit, there will be a breeding nursery on the left. That's the, the Z, the Zincaloom nursery, um, which, um, yeah, I'll talk about, I'm gonna talk about what we're trying to achieve with the nurseries. And then I'm going to go and um, um, talk about literally managing those nurseries, how to feed them and what else to do to manage it. Um, I've got another question here. How long is the average life of a dung beetle? Um, <laughs> um, with with um, with with vacca and bubalis, if we think about what we've said, um, the 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 F1 generation comes out say in January, and then that will feed, breed, sorry, feed, go into diapause, and then breed and then die. So it'll probably be be dead before the next December. So that is be 12 months or a bit less than 12 months. Um, very similar with uh, Bubalis, about 12 months. However, Coprus hispanus lasts three to four years. And that's one of the reasons why we, we're not actually putting that out on farms yet, because we've, what we found with Coprus hispanus um, is that they actually last for longer, but they don't actually breed as many, uh, brood, lay as many brood balls or breed, get as many progeny each year. Some say only four, four or five per year. We've had up to nine. Um, and so that if you're only getting four or six uh, progeny a year, it's going to take a long time to build up the numbers. 
Um, we've already sp we've already said you know VACA we've had 15 fold increase. Uh, a VACA female, for example, they reckon she lays about 50 eggs, so we could even do better than 15. Um, so anyway, so VACA and Ubaris last about a year. Hispanics last three or four years. Some of your summer, summer beetles, their life cycle is four weeks. And this is why some of the summer beetles are so prolific and being spread so quick, quickly because their whole life cycle is four to six weeks. And then there's another generation coming out so they can have several generations in the summer. So yeah, it varies on the species. Um, so going back to the slide there with the nursery. So we got the breeding nursery, the, the zinc alum nursery. Then we've got this tent, which is a, uh, we call it a PP tent, polypipe tent. We've got polypipe risers and um, and the the tent, there's a method of putting that in so the beetles don't escape. That also has a zip. You can see on the right that the zip uh, can be opened for your management and feeding, but there's some other very important strategies about the about the um, um, about the zip zip tents. Uh, some other important strategies in the second year for the zip tent. Sorry, I've just got to have a glass of water. Um, these will, so the two types of tents come in your kit and also with a, a tray that we use for harvesting. Very important to notice that it says for those, te those, those um, two types of nurseries, they're both reusable. This is a major point because when we look at setting this up and getting our breeding going, then we're going to use them again and again and again. And, and you guys are going to produce hundreds of thousands of beetles. That's what we're aiming for. Um, now, the reason this started, the, the reason this started having the two tents was that we put them in the breeding tent. We're putting small numbers. We want to know how successful they've been in the breeding tent. So we need to harvest them from the breeding tent and put them in 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 another enclosure. Um, and so really taking them from the first one to the second run with that little arrow there, one of the main points of doing that is we're counting. We're counting beetles so we know how successful they've been on each individual site. Now this this the reason that this i'm going to give you the reason this developed but then because of doing that it developed even further when we look at what we're doing with vaca is that we we were harvesting from the breeding the breeding nursery putting them into the holding nursery in january february because we knew that if we just let them go then they would all fly away they probably wouldn't find each other in um in uh, next spring we wanted to have them contained in one area so that they were they would be breeding next spring. So we developed this concept. We'll put them in the holding nursery. We'll feed them in there for their two weeks. They can go into their diapause stage in the, in the soil in that holding nursery. And then we can next when when they're ready to start breeding the next spring, we can literally just feed them in that nursery. Um, and um, and we know they're all going to be together. They're not spread out. They're all going to be together. So we can feed them in that nursery and start the breeding process in that nursery and then open the nursery and release them and let them go. So that's why we started doing the holding nursery. And then we realized this is actually a really good thing. Um, not only are we keeping the beetles together so that they're going to be um, breeding the, the following spring, but we've actually, we've actually created another type method of, of rapidly increasing the numbers in the next spring. Um, so what we're doing now, or we're doing this now for the first year, that's unproven, but I'm sure it's going to be beneficial. The beetles are coming up for their second spring. So for you guys, this will be, say, September next year. The beetles will be coming up in the releasing nursery. Call it the, the, the slide there with releasing underneath it. And, and we'll feed, feed that nursery until all the soil in that nursery is worked. I'll talk a bit more about what worked soil means in a minute. So you feed that till all the soil has been basically used or basically been worked. And then you think, right, because you're going to have thousands of beetles in there. You think, oh, it's too, the density, the density of beetle is, is too high for that area. There's not enough room for them to keep breeding. So what we're going to do is put kilograms of, or, or dozens of, of one to one and a half kilogram dung pats immediately around that nursery. Some farmers are going to put an electric fence and put a couple of cattle in around that nursery. So that when we open that nursery, the dung beetles can then just, oh, here's dung straight away. Just hopefully they'll go to the dung that's there straight away and start breeding 
it just around in that nursery. So we're actually creating an expanded nursery, if you like, to try and 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 keep those beetles together so they're breeding in the second year. So that's one thing that's developed. We need them to go into the holding nursery, especially with vacca, so that the F1s don't escape anyway. Makes sense to do that. Feed them in the releasing nursery, and then we can actually get a little bit more mileage out of uh, feeding them in the nurse releasing nursery by putting dung around it before we actually um, open the zip. Next one, thanks, Dean. So let's say um, we saw you saw the data. I'm saying we want to get from eight to fifteen fold with Anthophagus vacca. Let's say you start with 100 beetles and you only get tenfold. That means by the um, next spring, uh, sorry, by with vacca by February, January, February, you'll have a thousand beetles. If you put those into the holding nursery and you're able to um, to to feed that and to feed around that, then you've got potentially ten thousand brood balls in the soil. Uh, eventually, ten thousand beetles. You probably have more brood balls because not all the brood balls survive. Ten thousand beetles coming out the following spring. So already, in fact, next slide, uh, Dean, please. So if you put them in, this is what we did, put them in September 19, harvest them January, February 20, and we're going to be opening those releasing nurseries probably about November. We're feeding them at the moment and we'll open them in about November, we think. And so that's 14 months. 14 months is all we've had to do is to look after this nursery to potentially have 10,000 beetles coming out the following year which, which nursery is located near to your, close to your rotation paddocks so that you're going to uh, have cows in that paddock at the time the beetles are, the beetles are going to be coming out in the, in the following year. So immediately go to your rotation paddock. So we're doing everything possible to rapidly build up large numbers of nurseries on your property, not put a thousand beetles in a big in a, in a 20 hectare paddock and walking away, which hasn't worked. So this is what we're saying. We're trying to look at information and strategies so that this will be um, much, much more successful. Next slide, please, Dean. Now, with Bubalis, it doesn't have that February emergence. So we're actually putting those into the holding nursery as this month in September. Next slide, please, uh, Dean. And we're not too sure, but we're expecting about eightfold increase with, of uh, Eubalus in the nursery. So we're only starting with 50 beetles. Uh, so the numbers are hit by icons, but I guess that's 400 underneath that. Um, and uh, and so we're looking at at putting, uh, say, 400 in in this in this year. And then if we get another eightfold, we're still talking about 32, 3,200. Not nearly as many beetles as vaca, but it's, much, it's twice the size, probably more than twice the size beetle and probably buries twice more than twice the amount of dung. So you don't actually need um, as many beetles uh, to, to, to work the same amount of dung. I do need to say something here too, that, that we've done a lot of work on beetle density per square metre and, and the size of the nursery that you have, that has been specifically designed around 100 beetles for vaca and 50 beetles for bubalis. If you'd go higher than that, your breeding rate will drop off. I've actually got a video of two male coprosus suspanus beetles beating each other up, literally pushing each other out the way and throwing each, each other in the air with their horns. When the, when the density is too high, the boys fight, they don't breed. <laughs> That's what happens. So, um, so uh, this is why we've got these densities in these size, uh, in these size nurseries. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is one of the things that's really, really exciting what, about what we've just said. Just say you, you, your second, you, you, your January, February um, um, vacca comes out and you could put a thousand beetles in your holding nursery. You could also take a hundred and put them in your breeding nursery and put that somewhere else and start, um, and start another nursery. You could take 200 if you want. You could pull them all and you could put them in 10 nurseries. Um, they'll still come out and start in those nurseries. When you've got your, your potential 10,000 um, brood balls, the second spring, yes, only the, not all those are going to be inside the tent. There's going to be several thousand inside the tent, but you could, once those, you could have that tent closed 
um, before the spring of that season so that those beetles that come out there um, don't fly away. You'll have several thousand beetles in there, which again, you could let go on your farm or you could take them and put them in other tents and other nurseries on your farm. So again, this is what the system is that we want to produce rapid numbers of beetles very quickly, but then we can reuse those nurseries or get more nurseries and we can start putting those in dozens of places very, very quickly. Thank you, next slide. So in summary, the on-farm nurseries, much, much lower risk. You're not putting the beetles out in the large paddock. Uh, you're risking the breeding that way. You, you, you're risking them because we're selecting very carefully where these nurseries are gonna go and manage them. We're not putting them on a, on a site that might be dry that year or too wet that year. Um, you know, so it's definitely a low risk, uh, uh, lower risk method than putting them out in the open paddock. I do need to say something else there in terms of low risk. Uh, I want to go through today in this webinar um, the site descriptions and some issues that have come out of that. And we're obviously trying to do the very best job that we want. We want the best breeding site. For example, some, some of the sites, um, I probably wasn't clear in my questionnaire when I said, is the tree shaded from the north? Some might thought, think, oh, that's a good thing. And they've said, yes. Sorry, is the nursery shaded from the north with the trees? It's actually, no, we don't want shade from the north because um, shade from the north will lower the, um, the, uh, the soil temperature and uh, the, the, the soil temperature at 20 centimetres for Bacca and at 30 to 40 centimetres for Bubalis, that actually does have a dramatic effect on the, on the beetle activity and therefore the rate of breeding. So we want a warm site. Um, they'll start breeding at about 15 degrees C at 20, 20 centimetres Bacca and the maximum breeding rate is at about 25 degrees. Well, not many of the sites get 25 degrees um, at 20 centimetres. In, you know, might for a little while in the, in the peak of summer, but it's past their breeding season then. So we want to maximise the, the, the maximize the breeding. We want the best possible site. Now, because we're going for the best possible site for your breeding, it doesn't mean that they won't work dung on other parts of the farm. Those of you that got experience with dung beetles, just excuse me, another mouthful of water. Those that have had experience with dung beetles will, will know that the cows will, will pop on the laneway or the raceway or whatever, and the beetles will come in and they'll work that dung there. Beetles, when they're looking for food, they don't, they don't look around and say, I won't go there because it's not on a good soil type. They only want the food. Um, They'll go to, and I've seen this in France, they'll go to sites on really, a dung that's on really, really rocky, shallow soil, hardly any soil there at all. They'll go there, they'll feed on that dung, they'll just dig a little bit into that soil, um, they'll eat dung until they get sick of it or use that dung and they'll fly elsewhere. So what I'm saying there is that we want ideal sites for breeding, but the beaters will fly to other areas of the site, of the farm, sorry, and they will work the dung there but it may not necessarily be a good site for breeding. For example, they'll fly to dung that's, say, you know, in, a, in an area that gets waterlogged, and they might be feeding the, uh, on the dung there, and the rains come, and, the, and it gets waterlogged, and they'll leave it. But they'll still, they'll still, they might have even laid some broods in that area, but they won't stay there. Uh, the broods might die because of waterlogging. Their, broody, their breeding potential is greatly reduced. So when on any one farm, There'll be areas where the beetles will breed well and there'll be areas where they won't breed well. But if they're in the areas that are breeding well, they're always disseminating from there and utilising the dung on the other areas that they're not breeding well. So what we're doing with this low risk, when I say low risk, we're identifying the best possible site um, that we can uh, for your farm. It's a low risk site and the beetles will find those other low risk sites, as it were, as they spread out across the farm. I think it's fairly clear from what we've said that we're looking at much, much quicker results, not seven to 10 years, thousands of beetles within a few years. Really good thing about this process is knowledge. One of the failures of the past is not having knowledge. Now we're going to be learning about the life cycle. We're going to be learning about site suitability. We're going to be learning about how that affects our management. And I want beetles in this paddock because they're only a, a new species to my farm. And I want beetles there now because they're major breeding period. I want to breed up numbers. I'm definitely not going to use a drench there. It's going to understanding the life cycle will will help with that, with stock and drench management. This system is self-perpetuating. 
can be taken to other farms and to other regions. And it, it's a low cost in sense. It's a once off investment with all those benefits. What are the cons? It's a commitment. Fencing off a small area, that's nothing. Feeding the beetles is, is really not a lot of work. Once we get into the groove, uh, we'll talk about this in, in the details. Once we get into the groove, it's about collecting the beetles and we like to collect them in buckets beforehand. And then it's getting on the quad and walking and going down to nursery and putting in the appropriate amount of dung pads and it's done in 10 minutes, once every five to seven days. Not a big deal. Harvesting is a little bit more time. Um, it might be, you know, uh, for the harvest period for vaca over two or three weeks, it might be two hours every three days over that period. It's not a lot of work. Sorry, is that a question or just a, a bit of static? No, keep going. Okay, so that's the pros and cons of on-farm nurseries. Thanks, Dean. <clears throat> um, I want to give a little bit more background because this also um, illustrates where we're going with the on-farm nurseries. In 2000 and 2003, as I said, I released uh, uh, with Dr. Bernard Dobe and with the Fluoro Beef Group, uh, <clears throat> Bubis Bison on the Fluoro Peninsula. The map on the left um, uh, we shows there's little purple triangles on that map and there's a few circles. The circles have got a key on the left showing that we, we went and surveyed and we got from one to 33 beetles on, on those sites with their circles. The little purple triangle shows sites that we excuse me, didn't get any beetles um, in the year 2007. Next slide, please, Dean. So four to five years after releasing those beetles, we only found beetles on, you know, a third to a half of those sites, and a lot of them we didn't actually find any beetles. So this is, again, the old method, four to five years, and we don't even really know what we've got. 2015, you can put the next slide now too as we talk, Dean. 2015, um, we did another survey, and all those little yellow triangles on the Fluoro Peninsula, it might be a little bit small, not only on the Fluoro Peninsula, but going up into what we call our lower north, sewing up to sort of, um, you know, a bit more than halfway, halfway up that map. <coughs> <coughs> By the way, there were a few releases up in the mid north back in early 2002, 2003. Basically, all those yellow dots show where there was an abundance of buvis bison in, in 2015. For that survey, we did dozens and dozens of country roads, dirt roads, uh, drove down those roads, looked for cattle, where we found cattle, uh, jumped the fence, uh, looked for a cow pad, flicked over the cow pad and see if we found bison or not. And so we found uh, it's a measure of its distribution. This is really, really uh, exciting stuff, really, really important stuff. It's good and it's bad. It's exciting in the sense that what it's showing us that we only need to have these beetles established on a small percentage of the farms in the region, and then they'll eventually spread to the whole region. That's what I'm aiming at with these nurseries, that what you're doing is going to be a central work that's going to be spread out over the whole region. Um, how exciting is that? That's the good news. We can do it on five to 10% of the farms, and it'll eventually be a regional benefit. The bad news, it took too long. It took four to five years before we even knew whether some were there. It took 12 to 13 years to actually become a region. Next regional benefit. Next slide, please, Dean. I believe that with these dung beetle nurseries, we could have a regional benefit in three to five years. And that's got massive implications for production and for the environment. And that's why I'm so passionate about these nurseries. Next slide, please. So uh, just do a few of the next slides, Dean, because they're just ticks coming in. So we we try to address the um, the solutions. Um, now we've got uh, perhaps the next two as well, Dean. Uh, we had small numbers, we've got mass rearing facilities. Now we can produce large numbers. We want to release them in small paddocks. We've gone now to nurseries. We want to talk about site suitability. We're doing that work. You guys are going to be doing that work for your country. We want to provide information, we're doing that. We're talking about life cycles. We're talking about sensitive to drenches. We're talking about when to feed them. 
talking about crop uh, stock rotations. We've also added to that a method for regional spread, and and I I would like to see my vision is that we if these methods are adopted and they're working, that we're actually also we're also developing a protocol for future species. CSRO is still trying to bring, still in the process of bringing more species into Australia, and so we can actually use this for uh, for the future. So, yeah, um, that's what we're trying to do with this whole nursery program. Thank you. Great. Next slide. Great. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So just coming back to the point about um, diffusion of beetles across a region and yeah. took three to five years, um, if you take, and I'm just trying to give a more concrete example, so so where we are based is in the Muckleford Valley, uh, oh. West Castlemaine, and Sue and Andrew who are on this call, they are our neighbours, and then there's other people also in the program who are further up the valley the other way, the valley yep. to valley. Um, are you, I guess, are you alluding to the fact that if, let's say, if Andrew and Sue um, <clears throat> put out beetles and nurseries on their property, we do that, and maybe one other in the valley, the whole valley, that it could spawn, if you like, a population growth across that whole valley without others necessarily having to get on board? Totally, absolutely. It's just like what I was saying before, on your farm, the beetles will breed on the ideal locations and they will spread out and use dung on those that are not ideal. Same thing at a regional scale. They'll breed on these farms and spread out to others. It's 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 exactly what, what I suspect will happen, what I, what I believe will happen. But Oops. not only that, you know, <clears throat> I think it's really good to look at this regionally, and I know it's early days, but, that, that, you know, if you're going to take from your nurseries and put them on other farms, if that could be done at a regional level, you could actually take them to other areas as well. Sure. So yeah. my other question is the way we move our cattle, that's in fairly high, you know, we move them quite frequently and they graze in high density. So, yeah. you know, that's, you know, I think that works well for the beetles and that's what that's you're it. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Andrew is probably maybe does something not quite as, high impact as we do but nonetheless you know he's, he's seeing beetles there um but does that mean that other people because it's a it's a sliding scale presumably because if others are doing set stocking and you know the 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 density of the cow manure is way less let's say it's 100 times less than yeah. say on our yeah. place yeah. Have they got, will it still work oh look i believe it'll work but i don't believe it'll work anywhere near as good because you, you've got a concentration of dung in one area and that's going to be good for breeding. Um, yeah, spreading them out is just not nearly as good. Um, yeah, I was going to say something else about that. I just um, so, so, so basically, you know, for like there was a recommendation or a guidebook or whatever for people who are keen to build up their soil health using dung beetles as one of the tools and right. they need to revisit their grazing strategies to some extent. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a whole package. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. No, Thank you. We've got a question there from Joe and Jess. Have you checked to see what species abundance is in the Muckleford Valley already? Dean, this is a question for you, Dean. Um, sorry, can you read that out? Because I don't see that because I'm the presenter. Oh. Theoretically here. Have you checked to see what species abundance is in the Muckleford Valley already, Dean? No, we need to do that, and um, <laughs> so to we we yeah. Firstly, you, your guide that actually allows us to identify them would be very helpful. All right. Well, I've I've made a note to um to email that out, and we'll do that today, and people can uh, have their own. I'll, I'll email it to you, Dean, if you can circulate that. No, that's terrific. Uh, good. Okay, so now we're actually talking about the nursery itself. We're talking about what we're trying to achieve, and the numbers, and the regions, and why. Let's go back to management. So that's just an example of a, a of a nursery in a paddock that's used old gates to protect from stock. Thanks, Dean. Next slide. Thanks. Right. Okay, we call this an SZ. Um, one by 1.2 by 400 mil high, white shade cloth with a zip lid. And we found this ideal for vaca and bubalis, as I've shown you, um, 
um, in the in the photos, and you can see there this nursery is next to a grazing paddock. Thanks, Dean. Um, this is a nursery kit. <clears throat> it comes in a kit in a cardboard box, so you'll be receiving a box with the beetles and then a, a plastic tub with the actual beetles. Um, um, I'm just uh, with the kit inside the kit will become assembly instructions, but I can also email that so you can have electronic copy if you like. Um, I'm just writing that down, and <coughs> <coughs> I don't know. Dean, if I, if I sent you already, I can resend it. I've also got a, a tech note on handling beetles once you've received them. Have you got that one? Um, look, it's probably good to send it. I do have. Okay, I'll, I'll resend it. Um, I've got something. Yeah. Okay. Well, what we what we're talking about here is is the um, instruction instructions that go with things. So obviously that 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 assembly and instruction kit is pretty basic and just need some basic tools um, to put that together. Um, but the other thing that people ask all the time is um, when they pick up their beetles is, ah, I, I, I've got to drive somewhere, or I, I've got to put up the kit, it might, might not be till the next day or the day after. <coughs> How do I look after beetles in the meantime? So we've got a, a tech note, especially on that, so that you can know how long they can be before you need to feed them. And if it needs to be delayed, you know, what sort of container to put them in uh, to look after them. So you'll see when you get that tech note that, um, that you can comfortably look after the beetles for five or so days um, uh, before you put them in the nursery. Ideally, uh, it's best to get them in the in the nursery within within a couple of days. Um, so yeah, but anyway, you'll have instructions if you have a delay. Um, the 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 beetles will be <clears throat> actually. I'll, I'll, you'll, I'll, you'll see in a minute a slide of what the beetles come in. So next slide, thanks, Dean. Um, so locating the, the nursery, we've already said central to stock rotations um, to maximise the spread of beetles when releasing. Away from tree drip lines to minimise soil moisture loss during summer. <clears throat> it's really, it's, it's actually not, the, it's not so much the drip line that's the problem, it's the roots that reach out from the drip line. Probably really though, as I said in the site assessment guides, it should be the tree should not be, if you think about the mature height of the tree, if that was laying on the ground, <clears throat> that's about how far the nursery should be away from the trees to prevent roots sucking out the moisture. I know this from real life experience that we've got a variety of nurseries on a variety of sites on our, on our small acreage. Um, and definitely those near the trees are getting dried out. Um, now that's, that's actually really important especially when we're talking about vacca. I'd like to see vacca on at least some of your properties. Um, <clears throat> and you don't want, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you don't want, the, I'm losing my voice. That's not good news. We don't want the um, um, vacca to dry out. It likes a higher rainfall anyway, and it particularly needs some in, Jan uh, you know, you don't want the soil to dry out in January, February. So away from, Drawing root zones as your ideal site um, is possible. No shade from the north. We said that about the warmth and shelter from the south if you're in an area where you're getting cold winds. So it's about trying to, um, you wouldn't get many cold winds probably in the spring anyway. Um, but um, <clears throat> it's about, oh, excuse me. <coughs> yeah, those things that make the site better we're talking about. Now we talked about fenced off. Um, away from any flood zones, uh, steep is not necessarily bad, just a bit easier to manage it if it's flat and away from rocky ground because you want really good soil. Basically, you want something that is typical of the type of your type of pasture country you have. We need to be careful here that we don't put it in a, you know, in a silage paddock or something like that that's, um, that's compacted, that's not grazed or whatever, and your beetle performance will be there, will be different to what it is in your in your in your uh, typical pasture paddock you want to put in a paddock that is going to be representative of, of where the beetles are going to be performing for the rest of their life next slide thanks Dean. <coughs> <coughs> so once you once you 
constructed your nursery and worked out where to put it. Next thing is to put some dung in it before before you put the beetles in it. Um, you know, this is what I was saying before about collecting the dung and store it in a bucket with very small holes in the lid uh, to vent the gases, store it for three to four days. I'm not sure if I said it before, but the reason for that is, is that if you have any other fauna in the dung, any other insects, um, whether they be other dung beetles, if there's a lap overlap with the season, or there's some other small beetles, insects that actually do live part of their life cycle in dung, don't necessarily use much dung, but they live in there, they will contaminate your nursery if they get in your nursery. So when you actually fill a bucket with dung and leave it for three or four days, those beetles drown. So it's a drowning technology, drowning method we're talking about. The holes in the top are because the dung, obviously it's to be stored in a cool place. You don't want it to get excessively hot. You know, if it's left, if it gets warm and after four or five days, it gets pretty sour. The beetles don't like it. So try and keep it reasonably cool. But for three or four days or five days in a cool spot, it's not a problem. Um, but it will expand in that time. And so the small holes are to let the gases out um, without the dung uh, pushing up and basically pushing the lid off. Um, so that's the methodology there. Try and have the bucket almost full to the top so that when it does expand, it's not it's not going to be too much. And, and if it fills up, eventually expands and fills up that top air gap, you haven't even got any air gap for other, any other dung beetles to survive. Uh, we use minimum of one, preferably 1.5. Oh, sorry, if you go back there. Dean, sorry. <clears throat> um, 1.5 kilogram container, a saucepan or a measuring jug, and place five scoops of dung evenly around the nursery. Now, this has all been worked out for the beetle density you, you're getting um, and the, the amount of dung for those beetles and the size of the scoop and the number of scoops. This is all data that's come out of our, um, our research work with nurseries to give the ideal combination of beetle density and, and kilograms of beetles, uh, sorry, dungs per kilogram, beetles per kilogram of dung and all those things, getting my words mixed up. Thanks, Dean. Next slide. So once you've, yeah, okay. So once you place the dung in the in the nursery, then release the beetles. You can see the type of container that they come in. Uh, that's core peat, which is um, uh, basically uh, pineapple, sorry, um, coconut fiber. Um, it's completely inert, it's completely sterile, and we've got permission from the state quarantine bodies to send beetles interstate in that, so we're not sending any soil. The beetles themselves uh, go through a cleaning process uh, sand cleaning and a washing process um, and so yeah as clean as we can get them uh, so but we certainly meet quarantine regulations to go interstate um, and that core peat is is slight slightly damp um, and that dampness keeps the beet beetles from drying out and it keeps them a bit cool and the lid for that container you see has air holes so that's how they'll arrive in that container um, and so you remove uh, the core peat with beetles in it and place handfuls next to the dung scoops. Um, you can place them on top, but it's really no point. Um, the beetles will usually roll off the top and go down and go in by the side anyway. Uh, so you're just putting it down there, it's less stress and they will start looking around and start looking for dung. Don't be worried if some beetles, because they're, um, they're fearful because they've been handled by humans, they, they panic a bit and they will want to get away. And some of them just to try and get away, they won't immediately go into the dung. They'll go in all sorts of directions, but um, they'll just get to the edge of the container. Uh, you'll go away, you'll close the lid and they'll eventually come back to the dung. So don't worry if they start walking all around, uh, around the edges. Uh, so just keep repeating that until basically the core peat and dung is spread evenly over the five scoops. And if there's more males in one than females, um, uh, you know, they'll eventually sort themselves out um, and, uh, and and find their partners. You will find um, in the beetles we're sending that we will have um, a, uh, a greater number of females and males, um, as you do with any stock. Um, I don't know why, but we consistently get um, twice as many females uh, as we do males. I, I really don't understand that. Um, but it's very consistent. Um, 
sometimes we get up to three times the number of females as we do males. Um, it's not a it's not a problem. Beetles do like, in terms of breeding, beetles do like to pair up, and you'll often find that a beetle will pair up, and uh, and they'll dig their tunnel, and um, uh, the female will be down there in the tunnel making the brood ball, and the male will be going upstairs and and bringing more dung down, and so you often find they work in pairs, um, <clears throat> and you find that often the male, especially the, the the males, the bigger males and with big horns, they will sit at the top of their tunnel and guard it, guard it from other males getting in, so other males don't come in and mate with their female. But with the dung beetle fraternity, as with probably humans as well, there's there's guards and there's cheats, and the cheats are the beetles that that dig in a tunnel from the side and find the female uh, some other way, and so. What I'm saying there is, while they while they uh, do pair up, um, that that's not necessarily a pairing for life sort of thing. They do move around, and certainly with more females and males, you'll find you'll find all the females will be uh, laying fertile eggs. We've done this. We've put beetles in with one on one uh, male female, and we put it with high density of uh, female to male, and all the females obviously have been mating and uh, and laying eggs. Uh, that's just the way it comes out, that you're going to get more females and males. Um, that's good. Um, and so that's what's going to happen. So, yeah, next slide, thanks. So we said the initial feed was um, with your five scoops. And then we look at feeding every five to seven days. Now, that's going to vary depending upon activity level. Um, so the amount of scoops... Uh, Will, your place will be dependent upon how much they've consumed. So if you come back to the nursery in five to seven days <clears throat> and you might find this even first up, you know, if it's a little bit cooler there, um, you know, until it gets to October, it's warmer, you might find that, you know, only two or three of the pads on average are being consumed. If it's two or three of the pads are being consumed, put in two or three more scoops. Now, that's a little bit hard because if you talk about all five pads, they will be consumed to to a certain level. The real the real key is, and you, it's something you just you're just going to have to learn by experience. If you look at a pad and you say, oh, you you know, I put in I put in a one and a half kilogram, and it looks as about it's about half gone. Oh, you know, maybe that'll last till another five days. Maybe it won't. You come back in three days and you think, oh wow, there's only ten percent left. I've got to feed. So you've got to feed. Try and the idea is to try and keep five feeding stations going and 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 you're you're feeding the dung <clears throat> according to how it's been used if you put too much dung in there you're just wasting dung it's just going to get dry and they're not going to use it um so a common scenario is you know five of the pads will be say half gone and you say oh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna come back as i say in three days rather than five days and then put another one if you if you look at it and five of the pads you know they're only sort of 10 or 20 percent gone then you know you can wait till seven days. You, you'll get a feel of that. And it's one of the things that, as I said, for your own climate, your own situation, you're just going to have to work out the the frequency and the amount of amount of um, amount of um, pad you put in. Always put one or two scoops in, because it might be that there's something going on down in the soil, and you know those beetles of um, you know finish breeding in there or that you know there's a bit of fighting they're going on and some will want to escape and start a new home uh, so it's always good to have at least one new one new pad in um, <clears throat> one thing we haven't got here which is actually important we do we do actually do what we call adjacent feeding <coughs> <coughs> so where you've got your original five pads when you're putting other dung pads in just don't put them anywhere in the nursery put them adjacent to the to the original five pads the reason for that is that the beetles have spent a lot of energy digging tunnels and and making cavities in the soil to lay their broods and and if you put if you put the pad somewhere else they fly over there they've got to start all over again but if you leave if you put it next to it they might come up and they do we believe they come up there's more dung there so they can actually put more in that same uh tunnel system that same home if you like and so they're not wasting energy flying around and digging more tunnels. Uh, we, 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 this is the practice we use as standard practice. 
And this is the practice that he's been giving us the results that we've been getting. So we do adjacent feeding. Um, so in, around any one dung pad, you can go around that, you know, three or four times before you've actually filled up that area and then you go out from there. Now, the last comment there, it's okay to go over worked ground. It, it's obvious what worked ground is. Um, worked ground is where the soil has been brought up, where there was a dung pad, the soil has been brought up, the dung has disappeared and it's turned over soil and a few, few um, dung crust or remnants of dung on the soil surface. That's worked ground. So obviously, you know, you, you do your adjacent feeding and then eventually the rest of the area, then the whole nursery has been worked. And you say, what do I do now? They're still breeding. They're still going fantastic. Go over it. It is not a problem because they don't necessarily fill every square centimeter of soil below, you know, in the ground. And so again, we've done this and it's fine. And then you can go over work ground. Um, they might cut across a previous tunnel, but they'll still go and build new ones. Um, so that's fine to do that as well. Thanks, Dean. Next slide. <clears throat> During the hotter months, dung will not last as long. Um, uh, it dries out quicker. So this becomes waste. Um, that must be removed and replaced with fresh dung scoops. Check that there's no dung beetles in the, in the, in the dung before you discard it. Um, usually there's not. As we said, they, um, they like to suck the moisture out. Um, and so dry dung, they do, really don't like it. But it's good to... It's still good to check. You know, occasionally it might be one that's just walking around or something. Um, and so I've said, there uh, always must be some fresh dung in the nursery during um, active periods. And we've said, because we know about the life cycles now, for us, it's Strathalbyn, Bivalis, August to January, Vaca, uh, where they come a little bit later, September to March. Next slide, thank you. <coughs> Other management, obviously keep stock away, keep the vegetation low inside. Um, you know, that's why I was asking about your pasture type. I know some have phalaris, that's going to be, you know, big tufts of grass and it's going to be pushing up against the, the shade cloth. Um, that's definitely um, going to be pushing against the shade cloth. And no, it's not a problem in itself. It just makes it very hard to manage. You can't see what's going on. Um, if it's if it's pushing up high, then it's going to be get gets caught in the zip when you're trying to do the zip up again, um, um, and you can't see what's going on, and just makes it a little bit easier for the beetles to fly around. I believe the beetles will fly; they work, they will walk through grass, but it just makes the whole thing a bit more open and easier to manage, especially at, at harvest time. So keep the vegetation low. Obviously, we can use a brush cutter, and we can use that close to the sides of the of the zinc loom nursery. We can't use a brush cutter. Close to the sides of the of the of the shake cloth tent, so we just carefully do the bigger areas and um, and just do the edges with uh, by hand. Um, the other thing is check for any uh, uh, enclosure movement, fill in any gaps that might have been appeared, might have appeared when you put the nursery in, uh, and this will be in the instructions. You dig a trench to put the nursery, so it's down a couple of inches at least in the soil, and then you pack the soil back on the inside and the outside, because beetles will go to the edge and they will dig down a little bit, um, but they very, very rarely dig their way out because when they dig down, they usually come back up the holes that they dig. So we've not known any escapes from this nursery system, but still is important to pack the soil down around the outside and the inside. If there's any movement, just make sure it's packed down. Um, now maintenance should be done when the beetles are not active uh, that's during the time of the day. For example, uh, Bubalis is mainly an, uh, uh, is an, mainly a night flyer, moves from dung pad to dung pad at night. Uh, it does come out in late afternoon. So late afternoon to early morning, uh, Bubalis is active. So if you want to do some feeding uh, or any nursery maintenance, you do it outside that period. So early morning um, into early afternoon. Well, look, when I say early morning, sort of mid-morning, really. Um, and VACA is active from late morning to late afternoon. So we find, you know, about 11 o'clock uh, till four or five o'clock, um, VACA is active. So again, it's, we find indefinitely with VACA, first thing in the morning, it's cool. They definitely won't be active. 
Ibalas might be a little bit active, but sort of mid-morning they'll be fine. So we do most of our our, our nursery maintenance and feeding um, in the morning. Thanks, Dean. Um, I have a question, Greg. Mm. Given that they clearly work in shifts between the vacca and the bubalis, do you actually have them co-residing? Very good question. <laughs> we actually are doing that this year um, in our nurseries. Um, up until now, we've kept them separate because we're trying to maximise production and we're investigating them co cohabiting now. Um, my view from mainly from um, speaking to people in, in France, um, my view is they will actually cohabit quite successfully. Um, what we find with dung beetles, and again, I'm, I'm just quoting uh, Jean-Pierre Lumeret, which is probably the world's most knowledgeable person on dung beetles, um, who I was fortunate to spend some time with in, in France. Um, he said that the, the beetles competing, they seem to compete according to, he had a special name for it, was a, a certain range of sizes. In other words, Vaca, which is a smallish beetle, beetles of a similar size will, will, will be competing with Vaca, whereas a beetle of a different size does not seem to. Now, whether it's that or completely or something different about the way they operate, I don't know. But he said that you can often find a large beetle and a small beetle working a pad together, and they seem to do it quite happily. Um, so we're going to be testing that. But... The issue with that is that you're, you're obviously using the dung a whole lot faster. Um, so it can be done and it might need, it might happen on some, some farms where you might have both species, uh, but we need to be aware of using the dung faster. So here's a bit of summary of the timeline of what we've talked about. September, collect and store fresh dung in a sealed bucket. Now the beetles are being uh, delivered to... Uh, Victoria next Wednesday. I will discuss in a minute how you're actually getting them and when. Um, and that's that's if all my um, COVID preparations and police permit to get across the border and back across and my COVID test is negative, um, I'll be allowed to do that. Um, so it's all looking good at this stage. But what I was going to say is that you collect the dung on Monday or Tuesday, ready for Wednesday or Thursday um, feeding of the beetles. Um, so collect the dung, construct the nursery, the location we've talked about, feed the nursery and release the beetles in that nursery. And then from September to March, feed vacca. September to January, feed bubalis. Remove the old dry crust, crust and keep the nursery uh, maintained. And then, then we've got to start thinking about the harvest period. Now, um, we've already, already talked about late December, we need to be ready for the vacca harvest. August, we need to be ready for the bubalis harvest. What I would recommend, Dean, is that we have another webinar um, in mid-December and we actually go through the uh, the harvest methodology there. Um, and uh, I mean, we can discuss in a minute how we'll keep together, keep in touch otherwise, but I think we'll do the harvest one there. I didn't want to do that today's, you know, it's probably too much in one day. Uh, next slide, thank you. Now, this is the trapping, while we're not going to talk about harvest in detail, one of these trays will be in your kit. And the point of that tray is that those that mesh on that tray is um, is too small for vacca to go through. Well, it's obviously too small for bubalis, but it's too small for vacca to go through. You might get a couple of tiny ones, but 99% of them won't, won't um, go through that. So don't throw that plastic tray away. You're going to need it, need it at harvest time, and we'll do that instructions later on. But essentially, the, the photo at the bottom is, is giving some idea of how this works. There, the, you can see the edge of the tray there. And in this case, we've got a coarse sand in there and dung on top. The beetles fly to the dung or walk to the dung, which I'll talk about in a second. They come to the dung, feed in the dung. Then they go under the dung into the sand and they can't go any into the soil because the tray traps them. So we, to harvest, you literally take off the dung. And then you can either sieve the sand or um, you can, it's not, a, lot, a lot of times we just flip the sand upside down on something else because the beetles will be at the bottom. It's especially easy with bubalis because they're a big beetle and you can just pick the beetles out or you can sieve it through something, uh, but that's how you collect the beetles. Obviously there'll be beetles in the dung as well. Um, we don't usually worry about that in the sense that we just put it back, 
and um, and they've got plenty to feed on, and we might pick them up next time. Uh, when the dung gets depleted and, and worn, we might just wash the dung out as well. That's essentially how the trapping works, but we'd like to go through some more details at a later date. There is something wrong with this photo. It's it's done like this so you can see the edge of the trap, but in reality, the black edge of the trap needs to be covered with soil because a lot of beetles, they walk, be well, most of them really, they walk before they fly. Uh, this is another thing about adjacent feeding. They come out of their tunnel, they'll walk to the next lump of dung. Here they can, they'll walk. Um, if they don't find anything, they'll fly. And so if you have the, the lip of the tray higher than the soil, they'll walk up to that lip, then they'll start walking along the lip and they won't go into the trap. So you have to have a little lip, the lip covered with a little bit of soil. More on that at a later date. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Dean. Now, what I, what I um, wanted to do now, that's all I wanted to say on um, why we're doing the nurseries and our aims and the management of them. Um, um, you've obviously got the, um, uh, the PDF of these slides. So, Dean, you could circulate those around and people want to refresh their memory on anything. Um, and as you know, as part of this package, we're available by um, you know, phone and email, um, any support, any questions. So that's sort of where we go. But I want to actually talk about the project sites now. Um, now I've read through them and summarised them. And um, it, actually, Dean, is it possible? Is it possible now we can um, have everyone talking? I know, I know, it's, it's it's issues with the with the quality, but we're going to actually need to to get people's feedback on some of the things I wanted to raise just now. No, it's probably a good time, Greg, because we're near the end of the presentation, and there will be questions in any yeah, case. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do a question, questions people, first. Eh? People can just selectively unmute and unmute. They've got something to say. Yeah. I'm assuming there's other people still on the call. I haven't actually, I can't see as I'm, I've got the present. Yeah, yeah, there are. I can see a dozen or so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 11. Okay, perfect. Oh, no, 13, 14, 15, 11, 12. Ah, 14, I think, I yeah. Reading, yeah. So, look, we can have questions now before we go on to discussing your sites in particular. Yep, just um, just jump in and ask a question. I mean, so who's going to be first? We did answer a few while we we're uh, talking. They they possibly all gone to lunch and you wouldn't know it. <laughs> Uh, I'll ask a right, question. Well, yeah. Um, I'm on um, granitic sands and soil, yeah. right? We yeah. are in red gum, yellow box country, grey box. Can I ask? Can I ask who I'm speaking to, please? It's Greg Denny. Oh yeah, Greg. Yep. Yeah. And so that's why I said no. You know, yellow box you're saying was on heavier country, well, ours is oh, actually quite light. Right. Okay, right, okay. Right? Yep. Yep. And I'm just, we we will probably end up having sheep, not um, cattle. So does that mean that the native species are more suited to our area and they probably already here? Is that right? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, the native species will work sheep dung, but... If they had fully adapted to sheep dung in Australia, they'd be cleaning it all up by now because we've had sheep here for a long time. Um, so they, they don't, they don't, it's not, they're probably not their preferred food. And for whatever reason, they've not, not done the job properly and they, pro and they probably won't. Um, Backer is uh, reported as working sheep dung. Um, we've had, uh, us and others have had some good results uh, moderately good results um, with vaca on sheep dung, but I personally, knowing what I know about vaca, if it was me, I wouldn't invest in vaca for sheep dung at this stage. I, I, while it, we've had some results, I don't even know. I don't know at this stage whether it's worth the effort. If somebody wanted to for their own information, fine. That that would that would be up to them. But um, yeah, so so we really, you know, the, the natives aren't cutting it. Um, and the introduced species, we really don't have enough information. 
um, on this bit on their performance on cheat dung at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a lot of kangaroos and and uh, I haven't got sheep at the moment, but I will have. So that's where I want to head, and, and um, so the information's not there at the moment. You're saying. I'd, I'd say that, yeah, yeah, with sheep, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, we've got some questions on the side here. Um, why does the horn beetle have horns? Well, I'd say that's the way God made them, um, but it's how they use the horns, I think, is the significance. I don't know why they've got them, but they use them for, um, for defence. They definitely use them for defence. Um, that's about all I know. Uh, are there predominantly sheep dung species in other countries? <coughs> uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe so. I haven't. It's definitely not been a study of mine, um, but I, I I do believe there are sheep sheep beetles that work sheep dung in in a lot of the European countries. Uh, Sue, Luke, during very dry or hot periods, is it worthwhile lightly irrigating the nursery area? Very good question. Um, Yes, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> what what we in fact what we're looking at at the at the screen at the moment is the long term rainfall averages per month for Castle, Maine, and uh, Keeneton. Is that how you say it? Keeneton, Kineton? What do you say there? Kineton. Okay. Um, we actually um, we don't want the nursery to fail. Because in any one year, it had three months without what would be something close to the average, whatever that might be. Um, and we actually, um, those sites I showed you of, um, of uh, our results from 0.4 to 15.3, um, we had an exceptionally, exceptionally dry year, uh, a few months when we did that work. And we were monitoring the moisture, and there were about two sites that we did a light irrigation. Um, one site that we didn't do the irrigation, and, it, and we looked now back at the records, and we missed it, and it was very, very poor results, and that would be, um, we believe, from being too dry. So, yeah, that's one of the things about having the nursery. If it is a really, really dry year, um, we want to think in terms of what would it be the average, give or take, you know, 20 mils or so that we might have for that month and and we can put that on and that's very easy to do because as we know one liter of water over one square meter equals one milliliter so if you put 1.2 liters of water in the nursery you're putting on one millimeter of rain so if you want to put on a five mil rain you, you evenly spread six liters of water over that nursery um, but let's keep in touch about that guys and look at our rainfall uh, events and um, and and we we find that's best to modify as we go. At the other end of the extremity is that um, you could actually get floods. You could get you know 80 mils of rain two two weeks in January or something like that. You know it could happen. Um, rare. Again, because we're trying to hit something that is. <clears throat> close to average for the year um we actually uh monitor the rainfall ourselves in our own production system and if the nurseries are at a certain moisture level that we're happy with um you know we we, we look at the forecast and the next rain that looks pretty comfortable if we see a massive rain coming in when they're already at a high water level we literally throw a tarp over the nursery um, and most of our nursery facilities have have that facility with a system of being able to take the water off. So that's a very good, very good question. And it's a matter of keeping in touch with the um, with the weather. And it's not actually, you're still not actually, like what I'm saying, you're trying to get something that's close to average. So you're really just taking out extremities and you're still doing something that's going to be better for your farm, average, average in the long term on your farm. So that's a good, good, good point. Any more questions? All right, well, jump in at any time, guys. Um, <clears throat> I'll just go on to this um, bit of summary about the project sites. Um, 
basically the information that oh sorry could we go back to that one uh, dean i want to go back to that rainfall one <clears throat> basically the rainfall range was of uh, the people put in the forms was um 450 to 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 640 mils um and people talked about red gum yellow box gray box sites and two people spoke about their winter beetles um that was at um dean's and Connolly's. um I just want to talk about those those points. Um, obviously, uh, the, the the rainfall data I put on the screen is taken from uh, Bureau of Meteorology website for Castle Maine and um, and Kenerton. and you can see that the long term average there is is high, a lot higher than what everyone's saying. Uh, for Kyneton, it's seven fifty seven, um, and in the assessment sheets, people were saying. 600. Uh, that's interesting how local measurements or perceptions or whatever they may be. Um, and even uh, Castle Mains got near to 600. Um, so where I'm, where I'm going with this is, is when I looked at all those sites and if the maximum was about 600, um, I'm thinking, oh, these, these are all going to be Bubala sites. Um, we find VACA works good at five to six hundred, but seven to eight hundred, it was better, and you know eight fifty even better. So um, I'm, I guess I'm just asking the question. This is why I wanted everyone to be uh, have their have their audio on. Um, you know, are we going to look at those four fifty to six forty mils that people talked about? Because I I personally think if we do rely on that, then we probably would be recommending Bubalis for all the sites, whereas I'd be keen to see VACA on a couple of sites, and I'd, I'd be keen to see, for example, now that those down the Keenton area, um, they were actually the higher rainfall. Obviously, as you go north, it gets a bit less. I was actually keener to have some some VACA uh, sites in, in the on the in the southern areas of the project uh, of the project area. Um, so, could I just have some feedback and and comments on that? Oh, Greg, it's Grant Connolly here. We're one of the people that are just a little bit north of Kyneton, and yep. certainly our rainfall has been in the around about 600, 580 to 620 region. So I suppose we're a bit on that that border yep. of um, yep. what would be appropriate, which species. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I if you look at um, if you look at the table I showed before, you know, we had. Sort of, I said I, I would like to be seeing you guys getting from 10 to 15. Um, well, fold increase. Well, we got our 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 um, 15 fold increase on 750 mil rainfall area. Um, so I'm saying, yeah, I think Vaca would be good there, but it probably wouldn't be the prime site. But I, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I would really like to see. I think the balance would work on all the sites that I've been given, but I would really like to see, uh, I think for the future, uh, at least one site, if not two, um, going with backup. I think it will. I think it will work. I think it will work well. But well, I'm, I'm being honest with you, which is what you want. From the information I have, I suspect it wouldn't do as well as it would if it was 750. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm wondering who, how many will we have closer to Kyneton? Grant, you're obviously one of those. There's Graham as well, who probably went. I'm, I'm one of them too. It's Ross here, Dean. I'm one of them as well. Okay, Ross. Yeah, where, where are you exactly? Just about 13 k's out of Kyneton on the, on the Metcalf Road. Okay, well, that's good. So we've got the smattering of... So, so I'd be happy to give Vacca a go. Good on you, Ross. Yeah. Great. I think yeah, I'd probably have a go at that. Right, that was. So that. So sorry, that was you, Grant. Again, was it? Or was Graham Connell? Sorry. Oh, Graham. Graham. Okay. So you'd be happy to have have a go at Vacca as well. Yeah. Um, can I ask Dean? Yeah. Um, in this current batch, that's four nurseries. Is that is that what's coming? Yes. 
So you've got more than four people here. So um, which ones do I? <laughs> I mean, I've received five site assessment forms. So you're asking to choose four out of those five. Is that what's happening? Well, well I guess, you know, how else the four doesn't go into five particularly well, um, or five into four, rather. Uh, so, yeah, we'll have to make a call. And then um, because we've got the program another year, then we'll do something that's sort of equitable for everybody. Can do. Okay. Well, I guess my job is to discuss with you guys which species for which site. Um, and then you you can decide site out of the five that I've got anyway, uh, which four you want to do. Yeah, well, it, it could be that we opt to buy, you know, to get a fifth nursery. Okay. And everybody gets a crack at it. That might be a, you know, a better option. We just have to check budgets and things. Well, um, just on that, Dean, um, my original quote was for um, coming over and doing this workshop. Um, and I was looking at it last night, and um, while I've, I've still certainly, you know, did a lot of preparation for today and ongoing advice and all that sort of stuff, um, there's definitely some savings there. Um, so if you like, I could do I could do a requote for five. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's see what we can do with what we've got right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so at the moment, then, sorry, I just need to write this down and get this right. Uh, um, Graham is interested in, in Vaca and and uh, Ross. Yeah, that's uh, correct. That's correct. Well, I I'd be I'd be happy with that. If we've got two Vaca and three Bubalis, I really think that's a really good start for your area. Um, so thanks for that. Um, um, go Greg, on. I, Greg, one of the constraints was, and maybe uh, maybe that's changed, or you can make it work, is that you, you know you've got a limited number of beetle availabilities. Yep. So if you can work that into five, then you know that opens up that possibility further. Yeah. Look, our, our harvest has been better than expected. We we're not actually, um, you know, we can definitely do five now. Okay. Uh, yeah. That that's not a constraint to us now. We've actually done done really going really really well. I mean, the harvest's not finished, but early days, it's it's going really well. Okay. Terrific. Yeah. So five. That's not a limitation. Um. Okay. Well, we've got that. Let's just have a think about. A couple of other things that came up to me looking at the project descriptions. Um, two people spoke about having winter beetles. That was you, Dean, and and Grant. Um, Grant, he didn't know what species they were. Um, and Dean, I, I you, you put bubalis, but I'm not too sure you'd have bubalis to be honest. Yeah, that's, um, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, we would just yeah. have to have any beetles. Uh, you, you, oh, okay. You, you got here. You got some in winter. You got seven hundred and fifty in March. I had a few with bison, but we we got them from Bernard at the time. Right. Yeah. In March. So in March last year, yeah. you got seven hundred and fifty. Were they bubalis or bison? Bison. I think they were bison. Yeah, I think they would have been. Yeah. Okay. And and how are they going? Uh, yeah, they're pretty happy actually, and they've um, some of them have got yeah sort of. Um, Got itchy feet and spread south to Andrew and where, and where Andrew and yeah. Sue are. Yeah. Um, but we we certainly have noticed with the way we graze that you see evidence of them, um, you know, where the cattle are. For, you know, they're reasonably active. Okay. Other times you see the dung there and you wonder where the hell they are. But yeah, yeah, because you haven't had them that long, so you they haven't built up enough yet. And, and Grant, Grant, are your beetles that are active in winter? Have you seen them? Are they are they a black beetle about 12 to 14 mils long? Um, we, we've just seen the the, uh, the dung getting eaten in the oh, holes. Okay. I haven't actually seen a beetle okay. itself. Okay. Uh, do you know what months that, that would be? Oh, uh, we've been seeing, well, the last three or four three months we'd have seen them. I haven't seen as quite as much yeah. right at the moment, yeah, but okay. certainly yeah. over the last three months we've seen quite a lot of activity. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd be suggesting you've got bison as well, and it's really interesting. You, you don't know how you got them there. Um, I no, I think they broke through quarantine and came from somewhere else. <laughs> okay. They predate okay. us, I think. Okay. All right. This is really important. This is really oh, important. Great. Sorry. Sorry to jump in. Yeah. Um, the holes. Yeah. Um, if we look at the holes of the, our beetles. Yeah. The ones we have. 
and they're about almost the size of a between a one cent and a five cent coin. Um, maybe I'm wondering if grants are that size, or he might actually have much smaller holes, which might um, suggest a different beetle type. Okay, ours are about that size too, yeah. would be, so maybe they are bison. Yeah. Look, they could be bison, but it could be one of these others that I'm not too familiar with that occur in Victoria, like um, Alexis or Pecurius. Um, I've, I've never bred them. In fact, I've never even seen them because I haven't been over there digging in those patches. Um, but again, I think that's a really important to, to look at the uh, tech note that I'll send you on how to identify beetles. Uh, it'd be good if you could still especially uh, you, Grant, because you're not too sure what they are. The Dean knows that he'd release bison. It'd be good if you could actually try and at least find a couple of beetles, take some photographs and try and identify them or send them to me for photographs yep. to me to identify. Yeah, that, yeah happy to do that. be very important information. Yep. Um, just before we go on, there's a few questions. So I, I just want to... Uh, um, so, uh, so Sue's saying they get more summer storms these days, but they're localised. Uh, okay, so you guys can do some swaps once you're breeding well. We uh, we had a lot of autumn acti active beetles, but we're definitely breeding. Lots of soil brought up. But that's it. That's Sue Luke. Okay. Um, we're about to use Sue. Could you put that on the chat, please? Uh, yeah, we're next to oh, you. So yeah, where are you? Sorry? We, we were next to Dean. We okay, next, next to Dean. Dean. And uh, this was oh. in May when um, the, cows, okay. the cows were calving. So, okay, yeah. yeah, well, bison was out in May this year, so it could well be my bison there as well. Okay, cool. terrific. Yeah, cool. Thanks. But again, it's good to it's good to you know catch them and try and photograph them and then be sure. I'll definitely um, do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Um. I'm just flicking through my notes before we go to the last slide. Just bear with me. We've talked about that, 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 that. Oh, look, um, you've got a number of biodynamic and organic growers. Um, there's a couple that use uh, ivodectin and some backlining. Um, I just, I just ask that for feeding the nursery that it is entirely drench free. Now I know we might be looking at withholding periods and I know we might be saying Sodectin is, is, is safe and things like that. But personally, we don't want any compromise on this initial population. Uh, so if you could somehow work it out with your drenches or some cattle that are not being drenched, are they the food source for the beetles or something? I do ask that we could, could do that, please. Um, now, I think if you could go on to the next slide, thanks, Dean. So this is basically a wind-up um, slide, the last slide. So um, se September the 16th, I'm crossing the border to drop them at Caniva. Now, Dean, that's all organised, is it, from your end? Um, I believe so. Um, I think you were coordinating with either the... Aaron. Aaron, 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 sorry, Aaron, Aaron Aaron, Reeves. Aaron, Aaron, yeah. Aaron, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, so he, he'll, yep. he'll drop them off to me and then we'll distribute it pretty okay. quick to everybody at that point. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm arranged to meet him at 11, 11 a.m. on the 16th. That's organized. So you're connecting with him. Uh, I've already mentioned about the handling instructions, but I'll send them beforehand. So you've got them. And, um, then ideally construct and install those nurseries within within two days. That would be ideal. That's all I've got to say, guys. So it's over to you now. Um, if you've got any more questions or what you'd like to do from here in terms of keeping touch, um, whether you want more webinars or just the uh, you know hookup. I mean, sometimes another webinar is is good in the sense that down the track a few weeks there's information sharing on how they're going even if it was just a half an hour one. Um, but I'm in your hands what you want to do as a group. Yeah, um, look, that's terrific, Greg, firstly. And thank you very much for um, – it's a pretty exhaustive um, session you've taken us through there, and necessarily so, um, because we don't want to cut corners here because there's no point putting the effort in if it's not going to work. Yep. Um, and I think the fact that you know, the more of us – 
to get involved with this, the better, because we'll we'll continue those discussions amongst ourselves, and I suspect that um, you know we'll bring you into those. Yes. At some point along the way, or multiple points along the way. Yes. Uh, we're just find, trying to find the best way of. Yes. Maintaining that communication amongst ourselves as well. Yes. Um, and this this will sort of force our hand, I suspect, in that you know we've all got a self interest in having these beetles just reproduced at alarming rates on our respective properties and sharing them around across the group, um, and and really building a base uh, between from this year to next year and beyond because that's I think a terrific aspect of this. It's not like you've got to go and buy a new lot of beetles next yeah. year because all the ones are gone, mm. I'd hope. Um, mm. And so as you can see, for most of us, the whole beetle proposition is pretty new, um, if not entirely new. And you know, we're, we're at the very bottom of this learning curve. So if you can um, sort of hold our hands, so to speak, along the way till we get to a point where um, there's actually too many opportunities of punning here, I know, but where we've learned to fly, <laughs> um, and uh, then, then I think it'd be terrific and very complementary to our respective goals of building soil carbon and soil health. Yes. Um, I mean, one of the thoughts that I had while you were talking is, given that um, building soil carbon is a key focus for some of us, and probably certainly a focus for a lot of us at a, at a different level, maybe. Um, and the dungs have this, the dung beetles are able to, as we've seen, bury dung and hence this lot of its carbon, right? Yep. And they aerate soil and they do all sorts of things. So do you have any comments around the ability to build soil carbon using dung beetles and, and even complement it with other biological additives like biochar that you might feed to the stock? Yeah. Oh, look, um, it's huge. I mean, if you look at Berner's work, um, he did one experiment and he compared the soil carbon level before and it was just literally put some dungs in a cage, some, some dung in a cage, put the beetles in, let them work, work that patch of dung. That was all he did, just a once off. He measured the soil carbon before and after and it went up 0.5% just in that one one lot of buried dung. And that's what, a lot. What time frame? Oh, well, the, the buried dung would have been over probably a couple of weeks, but I'm not sure when he actually measured the the yeah. um, the carbon. But we'd have to have to look at that. That's probably in his book. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, but half a percent is is a lot in a very short time, and that's just only with one dung burial. Um, I you know you're talking you're talking tons of carbon. There's no other there's no other method or project. I believe worldwide that can put as much carbon in the soil as dung beetles. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, in Western Australia, off Barrow Island, they had a carbon was carbon dioxide injection system to put it into the substrata, and um, and it was a, it was like a four billion dollar project, something like that, with hundreds of millions of dollars of federal money, and and the life of that now. I, I, it's a while since I read it, but it's something of this order. The life of that of that um, project was literally only, you know, five to seven years, and then, and 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 it was only talking about you know tens of tons of carbon that they could put in the soil, and then that then the project was finished. And you compare that with the potential to put in twenty million tons a year. Um, there's there's just no comparison. It's just way way in front. And it's the cheapest way to do it. You know, nature's doing it for you, as you say, while you sleep. Um, so it's it's absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, you've got biochar. Now, biochar, um, obviously, you know, you're feeding the stock biochar, and the evidence for um, is that you know, there's a massive, massive financial benefit in terms of um, milk production for dairy cattle. And I know Melissa's uh, Rebecca has done that work. And I'm, I'm understanding the similar. I'm, not, I'm a bit out of my depth here. The similar, the similar um, benefits in terms of weight gain, weight gain for beef, for beef. But then the poo's going out, and that's got biochar in it, and that's putting it in the soil. In my view of biochar, it's it's a great addition, but the actual if you actually do your sums, 
the kilograms of carbon that's in dung versus the kilograms of carbon that's in biochar, I think you're putting out about 10 times more carbon in the soil with cattle dung than you can, and you, and you can only increase that by about 10% with biochar. Biochar is really good. It increases the soil carbon by 10%, but my view is that the biochar is, while it's doing that, it's good. People are going to be more interested in it because of the, certainly with the extra milk production, that's good work, and possibly extra kilograms of beef. So a good thing for carbon, but probably even better for production. Yeah, no, I agreed with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the biochar, the biochar also reduces the methane in re yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. emissions in cattle as well by up to ten percent. Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the Asian reduces it to nothing. Sorry, just say your name before you talk. It'd be good. So Tom Sweegan here. <clears throat> we talk of methane out of cattle. The detergent of the atmosphere, hydroxyls that are produced by a natural process called photooxidation, reduces the methane from all natural processes, including cattle, to nil. So it, it just all this garbage about cows and methane is just that. Um, thanks, Tom. Are there any other specific questions around Greg's talk today and how that might relate to you individually, whether you're doing a trial or this year or next year or not at all. And then because we, we said we finished at 1.30, we're pretty much smack on that. Uh, but we can take a couple more questions. I think that's fine. And um, then we'll look forward to the Beatles next week. Just while people are thinking about the final question, um, I'd just like to recap. What I will be sending you guys um, is text sheet on identifying beetles. I'll send you electronically the assembly instructions, a text sheet on handling the beetles once you've got them, a review of uh, pricing for five colonies, and I'll, I'll, out of today I'll be able to send a summary of the uh, species recommendations for each site, and I'll send, I'll send all those, and I'll send them all to you, Dean. Yep, yeah. no, that's, that's perfect. Um, well, again, uh, thank you.